Well, great. This is exciting. I'm uh, presenting a thesis tonight that I've been thinking about and developing for a little bit, and I'm still really developing it and and writing a paper on it and maybe preparing a longer presentation on this subject. Uh, so if it seems like it's still a thesis in development, I apologize. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, this will um, this is the kind of thesis that will probably assume a fair amount of integral knowledge. So um, again, if uh, you know if there's terms or things that you uh, that you don't fully understand that I'm presenting, I encourage anyone people to follow up with that. And of course, there's a there's a ton of available literature and stuff you can follow up on. And I'm sorry if I'm in any way assuming things that people aren't familiar with. So. That's my caveats. Um, ontological intersubjectivity and the return of the demon haunted world. Uh, it was a fun title. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first part of that, ontological intersubjectivity, which is a great phrase. I love that phrase because it sounds very sophisticated. And uh, and also because, uh, you know, it's kind of Steve loves to use this phrase. So I kind of use it as a nod to him. And I actually wrote a whole chapter about this phrase on in evolutionaries. And I'll just read a little bit of that uh, just to kind of give you a, a, a background in that. Again, ontological intersubjectivity is, there is the objective world, there is the subjective world, and then there is the world that we share between us that's in the interior of our selves, our shared selves. We call that not subjective, but intersubjective. And ontological intersubjective means that it's not a phantasm of our neuroscience. It is real. It's a real dimension of existence. It's ontologically real. And as I wrote about in Evolutionaries, I say, and just as we look at the external universe and see all of Darwin's endless forms most beautiful that have evolved in our biosphere, the internal universe the noosphere, that's a term of that guy, Tehar de Chardin, the noosphere, the inner subjective dimension has its own complex system structures and forms of consciousness that are evolving. Just as we come to appreciate that the physical world is composed of a truly startling degree of complexity, and even the seeming simplest structure is composed of complex configurations of smaller and smaller networks of particles and energy systems, so too we do well not to underestimate the complexity of the internal universe. Every thought, every feeling, every reactionary emotion, and each complex vision, careful calculation, or intuitive perception is built upon vast networks of interlocking and interdependent thoughts, implicit and explicit conclusions, values, perceptions, agreements, perspectives, complicated processes, amalgams of images and ideas, psychological complexes and archetypal patterns, and multiple layers of awareness. It is a vast internal universe, and the recognition of it helps to explain why the physical correlates of this dimension, human brains, are the most complex entities, as far as we know, in the universe. So that's ontological intersubjectivity. Now, the demon-haunted world is a term that comes to us from my first spiritual teacher, not really a spiritual teacher, but nevertheless, an important person, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, as many of you know, was the great science communicator of the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And he, Cosmos, was the inspiration for many um, in my generation to become interested in science and cosmological matters. And uh, I read Cosmos when I kid and loved it. His last book he wrote with his second wife, Andrew Yun, and it was The Demon Haunted World. And it was a kind of a expression that science must provide a bulwark against the superstitions of the previous eras to rush back in and take over our world and our culture and that we had to protect modernism he didn't use modernism he used science but modernism from that demon haunted world of superstitions right and it, that's a beautiful thing, and the, the book has a, is a beautifully written as he as he write as he is a great writer and a great communicator. But unfortunately, I think the demon haunted world is coming back, but not necessarily in the way he 
thinks it was or afraid of it was, although in some of those ways. And I think we have to accept that the demon haunted world is returning, but how it's going to return and the effect it's going to have on us are interesting questions in and of itself. And ultimately, and this is the thesis of this right, this uh, presentation, is that I think it has to return and we have to let it return with all the good and bad that that's gonna mean for the integral world that we want to be born. All right, so before we get into that, let's uh, uh, kind of a little bit go back and to look at the original Demon Haunted World and the original world of the, 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 the shamanistic and pagan, pagan world of our purple world in spiral dynamics or the, the magic and mythic world of Jean Gepser, the world of almost pre-modern world, but also pre-traditional in some ways, um, even though there's certainly a lot of superstitions in the traditional worldview, but pre-traditional. And we go back into that world and we see a world of a world sort of saturated with entities and forces and energies and demons and fairies and witches and, and all sorts of imagined entities and energies and ancestral forces that exist as part of the intersubjective, intersubjective world of that era. And the self, the self is more immersed in that world. The self is more immersed in the intersubjective world of, of that era. At least I would propose that that is what is true. The self of that era is more immersed in both nature and culture. We have less of an individual self. It's immersed in that intersubjective demon haunted world. It's also immersed in nature. We haven't made me develop the autonomous self that stands alone, independent of the other, and independent of culture, and independent of the social colon, and independent of nature in the way that we will as culture develops and as the evolution goes on. So the self is, the I is immersed in the we and the it, if we want to say it that way. The I is, is kind of immersed in the we and the it. Because there's this interesting dynamic interplay between the three great domains of evolution, the I, the we, and the it, as we go forward in culture. And in that early world, that self, the I is more immersed in the we and the it. And so we go forward. And it's interesting to think about how, you know, there's so many ways to look at cultural evolution and there's so many different patterns you can see. And I think... Uh, one of the things that's good to remember, and this, of course, gets to Wilbur's idea of transcend and include, that each level of culture is both a response and a reaction to an earlier worldview, but also a critical foundation for it. But also that worldview provides a critical foundation for its emergence. So it's this odd push-pull where things that happen in an earlier worldview provide the foundation for the next one to emerge. But the next one emerging is also a reaction to it. So it's both, right? And so we have to remember that interesting dynamic. And you can sort of see that dynamic as you go as you go forward out of that purple paganistic shamanistic world, you know, you see the emergence of what, what Steve likes to call warrior culture or in spiral dynamics, they call red culture or the emergence of the egoic self where the self kind of breaks free, at least to some degree, that warrior self of, 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 of being embedded in nature and embedded in the collective. It kind of breaks out of that and you see this emergence of the self in a way we've, we haven't seen this self emerge like that in human history. And then that sets the stage for the next rung of, of, of cultural evolution, the traditional worldview that both builds on is a reaction to that warrior energy and warrior self and is in many ways it, 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 it arises to contain it right? It contains the rape and pillage world of that era. It contains that warrior ego. It arises in reaction to it, but it also builds on that 
emergence of self. We have a new self in traditionalism that we have that individual self in relationship to a transcendent other. We have that transcendent religious sensibility. We have that, we have that, that I, thou emerge in relationship to that, that, that sense of the transcendent self emerges. So we have this, with this new sense of self that's emerging in culture. And then as we, you know, that again sets the stage for, and, and, and one thing I, I think is important to see, and I think sometimes we forget about this as we talk about cultural evolution. You know, I remember talking with Don Beck one time in, in, a, in an interview we did with him on what is enlightenment. And he said this thing that always struck me as very powerful. He said, you have to remember that the waters of each each like level of culture, each worldview, it, it doesn't, it's not just, it's a new set of values, but those set of values, they change the water of culture. It's like the water we swim in changes, right? And so as modernity emerges, and again, you have this reaction to the, to the traditional worldview, and the otherworldliness of traditional religion and the traditional worldview, and they have this pragmatism and that this world and build, you know, and this kind of engagement in this world of modernity. But you're also, but then you have this building again on this new sense of self where you have the autonomous self of modernity emerge fully out of the out of the transcendent I thou relationship, but also you know, this, the emergence of the autonomous self into the field of history as it never has before. And, and the I becomes very strong. And then the it becomes strong. The it dimension of culture becomes very strong modernity. The, the, uh, for the first time, we have the Cartesian split where he separates the, the objective and the subjective and so we can begin to look at the world through this objective lens and it's powerful and it's beautiful and we have and it changes it changes everything it's the it's the you know we get, we've gone through 250 years where the world has changed more perhaps than it has in the last 10,000 and modernity remakes the world and we swim in those waters right we swim in the waters of modern culture like we don't even know it, like the waters we swam in 300 or 400 years ago, the feeling of culture 500, 1,000 years ago, I would argue, was quite different. The waters we swam in were quite different. We sometimes forget how much a worldview remakes, not that our sense of self remakes so much, but remakes the very sense of being in the world. You can sometimes see in the early modern thinkers how much they almost assume the traditional worldview, they, they, that religious worldview. They almost they're swimming in it and they're they're expressing modernist thoughts. Right. You see this in the founders a little bit. They're expressing modernist thoughts and they're expressing modernist values but they're almost swimming in the traditional culture. They, you still just see it so fully. That religious culture is so strong. But then you fast forward 100 years and you can see modernism has already remade the culture. Now we're not swimming in, you know, we're not swimming in, you you know, in the, those early days, you couldn't really be an atheist. You could be a deist or you could be, you know, but, but by 100 years later, you can be an atheist. You can be all kinds of things. Right. So modernism slowly, but not that slowly, you know, remakes the waters and re envisions the waters of culture to the point where now we almost take that for granted. We almost assume because we've been living in that for so long. And of course, now traditionalism, there are pockets of traditionalism culture and they're powerful and they have influence. And there's pockets of postmodernism, which we'll talk about, and they have influence and they're important. But modernism is still sort of very powerful in the way we see the world. Um, So with the advent of modernism comes this very unique thing. We have this advent of science and of the objective objectification of the world and the investigation of the material world, right? As a, as a, rea as a reaction to traditional culture, which was so concerned with the other, other world. And it's so powerful in and of itself. 
and that is so successful in and of itself and technology and science and everything, but we're so obsessed with the, the, the objects of the world and the it dimension that we almost collapse now in the same way, like I talked about the in the in the in that earlier shamanic or purple world, like the I was almost collapsed into the it and the we. Now the it and the we, the, sorry, the 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 we and the I are almost collapsed into the it to the extent that we live in the material world. And if you believe, you know, many dimensions of science over the last hundred years. You know, the, we live in a dead world. We almost don't get out of physics. The I, we're not even sure we're alive. We're not even sure life is significant, much less conscious, right? We're not even sure. We're not sure we're conscious. We're not sure consciousness exists. We're not sure life is anything significant, right? We, we you know, the Cartesian world was so successful. It's like the operation was beautiful and perfect and the host totally was killed. We were killed. And the inner subjective world is does not really exist, and the we're not even sure the subjective world actually exists, right? It's just it's just phantasms of neuron, neuronal firing, right? And so that's both the incredible success of modernism and all its rot, right? And also the disaster of it, right? The dead universe that we find ourselves in, and. And it speaks to the power of modernism that it's had that much impact. Now, so we've gone from a world in which we have perhaps, you know, attributed all kinds of magical and mythic attributes to the forces and the energies of a world in which, to a world in which nothing is alive or even conscious, and in which the world is reduced to physics. But that is changing and it's been changing for decades and it's going to change a lot more because as we come back to postmodern age the postmodern age and by postmodern i'll just step back a minute for a minute and say here that by postmodernism you know i mean what don beck means by green uh progressive postmodernism we can put it that way there's so many ways to put it now postmodernism has an academic meaning that is only partially what i mean here when I talk about postmodernism, I'm not talking about like three major currents of, of culture, often a progressive culture, which are on one hand, the, the ecological movement of the 60s and 70s, the, the social justice movement, and also the consciousness movement, right? Those three pillars of postmodern culture, right? The ecological movement in all its forms, the social justice movements and all their forms and the consciousness movements. That's the I part of it, right? In all its forms, right? And the consciousness movements, of course, re react. And I think sometimes the consciousness movements, and that maybe it's just because that's the world I've moved in for so long, but they sometimes get short shrift in the culture, but they actually maybe have been the most powerful of progressive or postmodern culture. And the most influential, but the mo not the most obvious to the media. And in some respects, maybe the most important. And one of the things they are doing in the world is they're pushing back against that dead universe, right? They are reanimating that universe. And we're going to go from a, a universe that's almost like devoid of sentience to a universe at all levels, I, we, and it, subjective, intersubjective, and objective, saturated with sentience. Saturated with sentience. That's my prediction. And we're on that path, I think. In the and that's that's in some sense how the that's that's the the change that postmodernism is is enacting in the world and is trying to enact it. We'll see how much it succeeds. Now, you know, Carl Sagan has this great line in his book. He says, you know, the thing about 
like every proponent of every worldview always feels that their worldview is about to be wiped out. You know, it's like, and so Carl Sagan, of course, you know, you know, as he's dying, he's feeling like modernism is about to be wiped out. Of course, it's not about to be wiped out. Nevertheless, um, he says the candle flame gutters, its little pool of light trembles, darkness gathers, the demons begin to stir. So, you know, he was being dramatic. And of course, he was talking about traditional religious culture and the superstitions that are associated with that and the anti-science biases of traditional religious culture. But he was also talking about postmodern culture and the anti-science biases of postmodern culture and all the spiritualism of postmodern culture and all those consciousness movements, right, that are pushing back against that. And you've had... We've had now 150 years of various forms of consciousness movements that are bringing a whole different sensibility into the culture, right? From the spiritualism of the 19th century to the East meets West spirituality of the 60s to the new age of the 90s, and now the psychedelic renaissance of the 21st century, right? All of those are pushing back against some elements of that modernist worldview. And what they are doing as well, and I think this is important, is they are, you know, as those waters of culture change, right? It's like science, and to some extent religion did this too, because you have to remember that religion, despite all its own superstitions, it pushed back against the pagan and shamanistic world of purple and that magic mythic it pushed back against that because it competed right with their religious sensibilities so it tried to shut out a lot of that stuff and then science sort of completed that work and shut out religion and shut out all of these elements and shut out shut out what well at its foundation shut out consciousness i and we consciousness in all its forms as being rich and ultimately ontologically real. Now, one of the things that postmodernism is doing is, is, is like, it's like modernism held a membrane against that world, but postmodernism is inviting it back in, right? Little by little, it's inviting it back in. And it's with every major movement in the postmodern consciousness saga, from again, from spiritualism 150 years ago to the psychedelic renaissance of today, it's 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 thinning that membrane, right? And the demons are stirring, right? They're coming back into the world. And I I mean that as a kind of a funny thing in some ways. And I mean, but it's also true in some sense, those, all of that is coming back and it's going to be interesting. <laughs> and it's gonna to change the waters of culture in all kinds of ways, which I don't think we have fully appreciated up to now and which maybe we can't even predict. And I think, you know, and the latest version of this is psychedelics, which I think are going to have a huge impact on that. And, and, and the progressive spiritual forms in all its forms. I won't, I won't, I, I laugh about this, but I won't, I won't talk about UFOs on this because I know Steve's head will explode, but, but uh, I will, I, I sometimes joke that that may be part of this too, right? We don't know what's going to happen with that. That's a whole nother world, but the demons are stirring that demon haunted world is coming back and it's going to have its way in some form with culture. All those shamanistic things, of course, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. A world that's saturated with sentience is going to roll over the modern world in the next few decades, more and more and more, I predict. And there will be great things about that, no doubt. And there will be dangerous things about that, no doubt, and weird things about that, right? I said the return of all the demons, literally and figuratively, the conspiracies, the superstitions, the further erosion of common truths, right? We become subject or imagine we are to the forces and energies of those worlds. That will be true. 
But the, the upside will be that it will we it will remake and will reimagine for us what consciousness is at a foundational level. It will bring alive the our inner subjective and shared subjective worlds in ways that we don't even probably fully understand yet. And I do think that will be important for the integral revolutions and evolutions and renaissance to come. And I will get to that. So what's the point of, of all of this? So one of the questions I've thought a lot about over the last years and more and more recently is I think many of us see in the work we've done in this institute and in other places, we see the power of an integral worldview to influence the world. We, we can sense how important it is and we can sense how, the influence it could have, right? We sense that golden age that is possible, not perfect and never gonna be perfect. That's not the point, but we sense this, the integration of these worldviews. We sense the possibility, but for those of us who've been in this for a couple decades, the question starts to arise, how do we get there? How do we get there? Have we got closer? And how do we get closer? And what does that look like? And so that's the question that sort of I'm addressing in this, in this paper. And I, and I think of two different avenues that, that the luminaries in the integral world have sort of pointed to. And I'll and I'll, I'll start with Ken, right? So Ken in 2000, whatever it was, two wrote Boomeritis, right? And his point was, was, look, the boomers made this huge leap into postmodernism in the 60s and 70s, but there are all these problems with it. And now they need to make the leap into integral and the world will be right, you know, and that will, and that will be fantastic. And we need to do that. And then, a few years ago, he writes Trump in the post-truth world, which is in part sort of saying, damn it, they failed. It didn't happen. And because they failed, you know, we're, here we are. Okay, true. But it was never going to happen. I mean, it seems obvious now, and there were a lot of good things about boomeritis and the whole way of problematizing for the first time the downsides of postmodernism and being able to look at those objectively. And I think it helped people to see all kinds of things that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. But it was never going to happen for a generation to make two huge leaps in the same lifetime. That just, it was not going to happen. And in part, I would argue, because postmodernism still has work to do. And we can't have, just like you can't have, you can't have a postmodern renaissance in 1880. You can have it in 1960s, right? Because, because the work that modernism has done by that time is powerful and ubiquitous, right? We sometimes forget it's not just the problems of modernism. By that time, you see the problems of modernism, right? You see those tremendous problems of modernism. The environmental problems have become global, right? They're just, but it's also the success, right? You have the middle class, the ubiquity of wealth for the first time in history, probably, right? The ubiquity, not everywhere, but the ubiquity of it. And it gives rise to this new renaissance, right? This new, that couldn't have happened in 1920 because it was just, a, it was a too small a layer of culture, right? Modernism was not successful enough. And so I would say in the same way, postmodernism hasn't been successful enough. So what will that mean for it to be successful enough to get to that point, right? Where it can where we can get to where we need to get and where we want to get into opportunities that we see for an integral remaking of the way we understand the world. And, the, and so that's one, that was Wilbur. And the other was Beck, who liked to say things like looking at 
the world through a cultural lens, like to say things like, well, we have orange modernism and we have green postmodern pluralism. And maybe people can just touch lightly, you know, maybe modernists can just touch lightly on postmodernism and then move to integral, right? That was the, that's the idea, right? And I like that idea. I want that idea to be true. God darn it. I'd love it if that were true. I've had a lot of people say that to me over the years. I don't think it's true. I mean, it could be true. Maybe it will be true one day. And it's partial. And maybe for the occasional person, whatever, that's fine. But my worry is it doesn't really speak to how this works. It doesn't speak. And so this is where I get to, when I think about, you know, Steve and I have made a lot of common cause over the years with beautiful people in the mainstream and the modernist world who are almost proto-integral. They sense the truths in it a little bit. And they can see some aspects of it and they appreciate some pieces of it. And I love those people. And I think they are great. And I, if I, if I want to ally with them and, and, and support them and make common cause with them. And if I, you know, I think of Jonathan Haidt who wrote the righteous mind, beautiful guy. And I want, if, and if I had the way with the world, they would run it. It'd be great. I'd vote for them. They should run for office. But, 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 if I'm honest, and I look at the people who I feel that integral camaraderie with, that deep sense of camaraderie, that you share a deep worldview, that there's something about the depth dimension of consciousness, whether you get it through going through progressive spirituality or you get it somewhere else, that is very important to what it means to be, to, to hold this worldview. Those deep inner subject, not just this, uh, this deep inner subjective dimensions of consciousness, those depth dimensions, when you can see those ecosystems inside you and inside others, and you can move through them, when you understand those dimensions of the noosphere, what Tehar de Chakardin, when he talked about seeing, he was talking about that integral cognition to see those dimensions. And I think to fully, to, and so when I think of people who have gone, who, who, who share that in some ways, They've often share it because they share that depth dimension. And often, not always, that means they've gone through progressive spirituality. And sometimes in those proto-integralists and those other worlds, they just don't quite get there. That's okay. I still want them to run the world. But I can't help but wonder if the remaking of our own, of the waters of self and, and, and culture, such that we are, they are remade, such that all that demon haunted world comes back into this world. Not that we're going to embrace all the superstitions of the past, but that the world is once again sort of saturated with consciousness and sentience in such a way that it will be successful enough as a worldview to authentically set the stage for the integral revolution and evolution and renaissance to come. I think that has to happen. And I don't think we're near that, but I think the, the next decades will bring that potentially so that we will get to a place where that can happen. And I hope that's not bad. I don't mean that to be bad news, trying, but I think it's real nonetheless. It's just my opinion. You can disagree with me. But what does it mean about how we engage with culture? So my last piece here is I just wanna 
say that I think it means a couple things. It means it means that postmodernism, when it's successful, re will revivify the dead universe and bring some aspects of that depth depth dimension, not just to you or to me, but to the waters of culture we swim in. It will be successful in that way. And that success will be a critical foundation for the next layer. I don't think postmodernism can be put back in a box. It's got work to do still, and it needs to be successful. And of course it's got, you know, unhealthy aspects and healthy aspects. And I think the last thing I will say here is I think the work it demands from us as people who are supporting cultural evolution in its best forms. You know, for many years, I have often thought that the work, at least that I found myself most interested in was, I don't know how to say this exactly, like, was supporting modernism, trying to defend modernism, because modernism had an enemy it didn't see. Modernism had an enemy from its left flank, and it had no idea it was there, right? Postmodernism was criticizing it and undermining it, and it didn't see it. And so revivifying and re-embracing modernism, speaking to postmodernists about how important modernism, the healthy aspects of modernism, is really was really important and is really important, right? And still is really important. And we have to do that work because we can't let the forces of, certainly of traditionalism, but also postmodernism swamp all the gains of modernism because it's so important. The wealth, the, the science, the technology, all of those things, we have to go forward with those things, right? So we can't let postmodernism swamp those. And so defending it is really important. And in that, making common cause with smart, healthy modernists is something that's important. But we've gone through a bit of an interesting phase in culture now with the emergence of the last years of the social justice movement and of wokeism and all its good and bad forms. We ha we've had certain parts of postmodernism is have, have exploded onto the cultural scene in people's minds. I'm not, they've been, we know they've been building up for a while, but they've exploded on the cultural scene in people's minds. And now we have a whole culture that's in reaction to postmodernism. There, we have a whole bunch of people, a lot of the same people who were once defending modernism from traditionalism after 9-11, right? The Sam Harris's of the world, right? Who defending against traditionalism, you know, all that, are now doing the opposite. They're they're defending modernism from postmodernism, right? And they're they're going like this to postmodernism. And I understand why. And many of them are doing an authentic service to the culture by defending modernism. But for the first time, maybe, and maybe this has always been true, but I feel it. We can't just defend modernism. We also have to advance postmodernism. We also have to support its movement. We have to support its success. We, it needs to be successful. And as integralists, that can be hard sometimes because we can be in a bit of a dialectic with postmodernism, but we have to support its success. It needs to be successful. We can't just pretend it's not there. We can't just touch lightly on it and pretend it's not there. Sorry, I don't think we can. Part of me would like to at times, but it needs to be successful. The demons have to ride and we have to somehow get them to ride in the way we, in the way without fucking up the rest of the culture, right? So, you know, we can, you know, just the, the last piece of this is I say, you know, we can criticize, you know, the downsides of kind of wokeism, but the world needs to be more just. We can defend science, but the world needs to be re-enchanted with consciousness and saturated with sentience. We can criticize the nasty, nasty misanthropy mis of the ecological movement, 
but the world needs to become more environmentally sound and sensible. And I think of, you know, imagine you're a modernist, rational, scientific, liberty, economic liberty in the, you know, in the, I know this wasn't true, but in the 16th or 17th, 17th or 18th centuries, and someone tells you that what you really need to do to bring about the world you want is support all of these super intense and restrictive Protestant movements in Northern Europe. Because what we now know is the success of all those movements was part of the success of traditionalism. And that's the, and it was in those cultures that modernism first arose, right? In all its, in its forms. But that's a hard message to a modernist at that era, right? That's, but as integralists, I feel like sometimes we can be in a bit of a dialectic with postmodernism, but we have to see its success and we have to embrace its success. So we have to do two things, maybe, in the way that we have. We have to support that modern world and make sure it's not swamped. And we have to let the demons ride again on the waves of history so that the world will be remade in the depth dimension of consciousness, which will set the stage for the integral renaissance. Those two things. And with that, I'll leave it. And thanks so much for listening, and I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Carter. All right. Um, well, why don't we take a moment and um, just want to open it up, see if you have any questions for Carter, if you want clarity on anything, you want him to riff off anything, um, raise your hand using the reactions button, and I will call on you. Let's start with Steve. Go for it. Thank you. That was really awesome. I had a joke there about uh, say that whole part you read three times fast, <laughs> just for fun. But anyway, really good. I love the uh, observation about the uh, swimming in culture. Mm. And what occurred to me as uh, you were talking about that is the pace of cultural change which at least it seems like it's accelerated uh, in you know recent years. And but at the same time, we're living twice as long as the people did, you know, a few centuries ago. So that seems like really an opportunity because yeah. we might be more aware of the water that we're swimming in because we can see it changing during our lifetime. And that might prepare us better to become a part of that change. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I don't think there's any question. That's true. I agree. And I, you know, timing is one of those things. Who knows? I have no idea. You know, it's very hard to predict timing because the moment you really say it's going to be a while, it, it will totally surprise you. And, you know, but and I don't think there's any question. I mean, look, I mean, Traditionalism had like a thousand years, right? To prepare the world for modernism, right? Modernism had what, 200 to prepare the world for postmodernism. And we have no idea what that next timeline is like really. But I'm just saying, I think that we need to, it needs to continue to do its work and its work may be more profound and culture transforming than we realize to, to pave the way. Great. But yes, I All agree. Right. Michael Grady and then Larry. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Carter. Thanks for getting the my, my brain swimming in a good way. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I, I have a question here, but I just kind of want to, in, in a parallel way that I'm thinking about this, is that, uh, you, you know, it, it seems like where we're at politically is that we're becoming unmoored from kind of reason and logic and this the, the kind of norms that we all agreed on to maintain this order with yes. these new style of leaders like and even and people who are really the, the, the kind of warring gods as they say in tibetan buddhism like these guys are just rising and cutting through the cutting through all the noise and saying listen to me and there's this just this hope for kind of clarity and so we're kind of in, in some ways you could view these i do it in some sense of like 
these are these kind of irrational forces rising up yes and kind of leading us and pulling us in and pushing and that sometimes i'm like no what's going on but it's also you know you have to give consideration to like what if this is evolution pulling and pushing us in a direction we don't want to go and it's a phase and it's something that kind of scares me it's demonic but also like we have to move beyond how we thought about things um and then and then also what's under attack is just the whole notion of western liberalism as a geopolitical force and so like these authoritarian de- what i view as backwards demonic forces are kind of rising up and gaining as you say are is, this might be happening these de- these forces are rising up and getting more influence um and then just one final cuz just very intriguing elon musk said today about sam harris who's one of the most rational people he's just kind of distancing himself saying that his mind is turning to goo when he's probably one of the most irrational people or the most rational thought uh, influencers on the earth so so i just put that out that's kind of what comes up for me but how do you see uh, i wasn't clear on like how how do you see these what did you call the that demonic forces what did, what was your phraseology was it demon the, haunted the, shadow, the what demon haunted demon haunted world inhabiting our world because it we might be looking right at it but how do you see it well i i think you expressed a lot of the dangerous currents that are part of the undermining of the modernist order and that will and i think that's the those are the dangers we have to work against to some degree right but i think we you know because as as postmodernism in its various forms undermines modernism or pushes against modernism or pulls that membrane away of culture it allows other regressive forces to also attack from the other side right it weakens the defenses overall right of the western liberal order or whatever that was and so with that and i don't think we're going to put that back together in the same way we're going to have to find new alliances and new ways to put that together in a way that includes more of postmodernism and include and i don't know what those look like right but um but i think we got that is you know I, I again that's it's you describe the dangers i worry about and it's one of the reasons why we have to defend modernism um but we have to defend modernism in a way that that uh that doesn't just doesn't just bar the door of history to the the way in which the way in which postmodernism is trying to remake the world you know and that's a you know that takes some serious wizardry i i acknowledge but it's a it's a you know and there's going to be different forms of it that emerge and i think we all have to be on the lookout for the for the healthy forms of that that emerge so we can support them and and give them life and energy as opposed to so many of the unhealthy ones yeah and, and just one final point is that you know when we get in touch with that language around these demonic forces like it's the tibet new new year which is the wood dragon and I've kind of listened like the and the wood dragon is kind of that fierce energy, you know what I mean? So it's very animating, you know. It kind of gives you a sense of, fuck yeah, I, that I need some, I need some, you know, I need some dragon energy to push back on. <laughs> like that, you know? and and why not? So, but yeah, just some other thoughts, and I'll I'll turn it over to somebody else. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. All right, Larry, and then Michael Abrams, Abramson. Hello. My question is, is that I, I'm I was moved by the um, the plea for the success of postmodernism, and I started to wonder about what that would look like. And I was wondering, Carter, if you would say that the veganization of the world would be an outward sign of the success of postmodernism. That's a very, are you a vegan? I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I, I like the idea of it. 
I yeah. had a, uh, but, 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 um, but it seems to me like it's a, ne a necessity for the planet. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I really think is that, I'm, so I'm a life, I'm a, I'm a 30 year vegetarian. So um, I'm the vegan. Um, but what I really think is a deeper concern about the nature of and the success of animals on the planet in all various kinds of forms, including how we eat them, would be a would be a would be an example of success. Well, that doesn't mean everyone has to be vegan or anything like that. But and in the long run, maybe we'll have lab grown meats and that will take care of itself. But I do think that a deep concern about the the nature, again, the nature of these these sentient creatures we share and their success and their thriving as is a huge part of what me what what postmodernism success would mean i think yeah thanks thank you all right carter steve go ahead and then brad so first carter thanks for a, a great presentation uh really uh thought provoking um my question is about what it really means to help postmodernism succeed yeah you know Good. and of course that's a you know we could talk about that for hours but yeah when I was drawn into postmodernism in the early 70s, again, as a defined term, we're using it as this green stage of development. Yeah, right. The thing that attracted me the most was uh, what we're calling progressive spirituality, right? I yeah. guess the consciousness movement is is a good way to phrase, you know, whatever is left of it today. But when you and I have talked about this subject, you, I think, were really brilliant in identifying the three major pillars of this worldview, which are into you know, the social justice piece, the um, environmental piece, and then this consciousness piece. And maybe I've lost touch with the culture. I mean, it's still out there, but it seems as though that that since probably over the last 10 years or so, that this progressive postmodern worldview, the one that I was drawn into and had my loyalties associated with for the majority of my life, has kind of fallen apart. It's kind of regressed, you know, that the social movement, the social justice thing has become ethnocentric. And the consciousness thing it no longer has the same cultural vitality that it had, you know, 10 years ago and, and over. It seems like much of that is, is kind of fallen by the wayside. And so, yeah. um, you know, I'm just kind of wondering, I mean, obviously if we, if postmodernism were to succeed completely, it would wipe out modernism, right? Exactly. That, so, we, so, you it know, can't we succeed want, completely. We want, yeah. We want it to succeed in breaking the spell of modernism and helping us, you know, move beyond that unsustainable culture. But at the same time, you know, we want to transcend it. And so what is, you know, maybe you could say a few words about what that, what that means. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a good question. It's a very important, like, like cultural evolution at this moment in history cannot just repeat previous eras in the sense that traditionalism takes over the culture and then sets the stage for modernism and modernism takes over the whole culture and sets the stage. You know, it's like we can't afford that anymore. We can't allow postmodernism to just take over the culture because it will sweep away so many things that are absolutely critical for what we need for the next stage of, of development and just for human thriving, right? We just need that. So we can't allow that to happen. But I think you're right. And I think, I do think, well, there's a, there's a lot of pieces in there, Stephen. It's a great question. But I think that... Um, I think that's right. I think woke, you know, it's some of the the social justice movements have become ethnocentric and are in some ways the least healthy forms and have, uh, have produced the the antibodies in modernism, which on one hand are a good thing, but also aren't necessarily helping the positive versions of postmodernism either. And so that's a that's a problem in the way that that dynamic has sort of got stuck in culture, and it's, we're going to be dealing with that dynamic for at least a decade or so, you know. So I still think that the, and I think the consciousness movement lost a lot of momentum after the financial crisis to some. And I think that was because that was such a hit in some ways to the wealth, to modernism and to the well, all the success of modernism, like the consciousness movement is so built on that, that it costs some of that. But I, my hope is it's, it's, it's going to find its feet again, and it may be finding its feet again. I think, you know, I think um, we'll, we'll see what that looks like, but I honestly, but my, but just in the last couple of years or a few years, I felt like that movement is maybe beginning to, uh, find new traction 
in culture. And that's my sense. Now, I think we won't know for sure for another decade, but my sense is that maybe that there's a new there's a new kind of push forward in that piece of green. And I hope that will be very positive. And I hope that we'll have another push to bring kind of the depth dimension of consciousness into the culture in a way that will set the stage for what we're looking for, which is the neck, which is a potential integral, integral emergence. But uh, but I so that that's my that's my reading on it. But in a way, I didn't feel like that five or 10 years ago. Now, maybe that's just me. And I'm not always in touch with, I don't know what the 20-somethings are doing necessarily either. But, uh, but I do think, I, but I felt this new spirit around it. And look, some of that's to do, there is something around the psychedelic renaissance that I think is pushing that as well, because that's becoming such a big thing in culture. You kind of see that pushing that forward. So where that goes or how that evolves, I don't know quite. Maybe it will peter out in some way that's not interesting but maybe it will also have an impact yeah. yeah right on could do you think perhaps the return of the demons uh, <laughs> may, maybe maybe the bath water but that the baby is psychedelics in the sense that i've seen and I'm, I'm sure all of you have as well and maybe maybe this applies to some of you i've seen some deeply seated um mistranslations you know like uh as ken would say sort of like tokens of consciousness arrested at lower stages of development freed because of a psychedelic experience and 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 perhaps perhaps that's part of the the baby with the the demons here i mean you know you have to kind of swallow the whole fish you know I, i'm listening to friends extol the virtues of uh of ayahuasca and they won't stop talking about it and they become quite magical but at the same time they are different better people and maybe that what do you think about that being part of the 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 baby that that's that's brought back with the demons that helps people transition to integral i i agree and i think i would go even further and say i think that's part of what's opening up the membrane because I'm sure your friends or maybe they're better people. And they also probably believe deeply. They probably have a very different view of what consciousness is having gone through those experiences and, oh, yeah. and a different sensibility of what that is. So I think that's part of it. I do. I think it's going to have a big impact. I think I had a big impact in the sixties, right? It kind of was part of the explosion and then it kind of went underground for a long time. But I think that in the 2020s, it's going to be, have a huge impact. Yeah. Okay. And thank you. That was, and I, 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 I should say I've got, I've done psychedelics recently and I never really did psychedelics before. So I'm, that may be entirely colored by my own experience, but I don't think it is, you know, so we'll see. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. It was, a, it was a really great talk. It seems like what you're expressing is a healthy teal. Um, and my perception of a healthy teal would be a, a, a worldview that supports an, uh, a healthy green and a healthy orange and a healthy uh, amber and a healthy red to all be present simultaneously. That's my perception of healthy teal. Yeah. And so that seems like an a, a, a overview of what you're proposing here. And who knows what that exactly will look like? I mean, we don't know, but that's. I hope like so. That. Yeah, I hope so. And I, I think that's right. I think ideally that's right. And I think, you know, at different moments in culture, different different currents are stronger and maybe require a different response or different, you know, but overall what you're saying, I totally agree with. Yeah. 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 Y